Chicago, of course, is the third largest city in America. It's one of the great global cities, and it's facing serious questions about its future, serious challenges, and those extend from everything to the budget, to education, to immigration policy, housing, jobs, neighborhood safety, and so much more. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, we'll have a chance to hear from the candidates here as they express their thoughts and views on some of those many important issues. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Warren Chapman. I'm the Vice Chancellor for External Affairs at the University of Illinois Chicago. On behalf of President Michael Hogan and the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois and Chancellor Paul Allen Mears, the Chancellor at the University of Illinois Chicago, we'd like to welcome you here today. Uh, and I would like to express my gratitude for all of you to come out to what we have considered to be a main event in this up-and-coming election year in Chicago. Thank you for joining us for the Chicago Mayoral Candidate Forum. It is our hope that this forum will help the UIC community and the community of Chicago and its voters to learn more about all of the candidates, their platforms, their values, and their visions for the city of Chicago and its future. I'd like to take a few moments to thank some individuals for their hard work and support of this event. First of all, for the co-hosts, the University of Illinois Office of the Chancellor, the Student Government Association at the University of Illinois in Chicago, WBEZ-FM, and the Better Government Association. Also sponsoring today's event is the Institute for Government and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois and the Honors College here at UIC. I would be remiss if I did not recognize one of our trustees who's attending the affair today, Dr. Francis Carroll. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to thank the planning committee who spent hours trying to put this event together today, uh, Dr. Barbara Henley, Saeed Jamil, Penny Hunt, Catherine Lang, Deshana Fournay, Bob, um, I mean, sorry, Dick Simpson, and a special thanks to Teresa Soto, who really helped pull this thing together for us. Now, I have two special thanks I'd like to extend at this moment. First of all, to all of you who took time out of your busy day to come to this event. Thank you very much on our behalf. Please give yourselves a hand. And another special thank you to all the candidates who responded to come and spend time in their busy campaign schedule to share their ideas and thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Let me now introduce the moderator for this event, Steve Edwards who is the Content Development Director at WBEZ-FM and host of the station's weekly political segment, The Best Game in Town. From 1999 to 2007, Steve served as host of 848, WBEZ's acclaimed daily news magazine program, where he covered everything from public policy to pop culture. During his tenure, 848 was named Best Public Affairs Program by Chicago Magazine and Best Morning Radio Program by New City Chicago. Let's welcome Steve to the stage. Thank you, Warren. Good afternoon. It's great to see so many of you here today on what promises to be a very important exchange at a very important time. And on behalf of WBEZ 91.5 FM, we're delighted to be collaborating on, with UIC on this exchange. Chicago, of course, is the third largest city in America. It's one of the great global cities. 
and it's facing serious questions about its future, serious challenges. And those extend from everything to the budget, to education, to immigration policy, housing, jobs, neighborhood safety, and so much more. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, we'll have a chance to hear from the candidates here as they express their thoughts and views on some of those many important issues. Um, before we begin, a few quick program notes. We are recording this for WBEZ, and CAN TV is also recording this for future broadcasts as well. So we ask that you take a quick moment right now, if you haven't already, to silence anything that you have that might beep or uh, otherwise make noise during the course of this exchange. Also, immediately following for media here, there will be uh, press availability and opportunity for you to talk with uh, the candidates participating, if that's uh, of, of interest. And without further ado, I'd like to begin by introducing the candidates here who are assembled with us today. Uh, I ask that you applaud when we ask you to, but during the course of the exchange that you refrain from your applause in the interest of respect and fairness for the candidates here with us today. And with us for today's forum are Congressman Danny K. Davis, the Reverend Wilfredo de Jesus, City Clerk Miguel Del Valle, Ryan Graves, Fenton Peterson, Patterson. Jay Patterson, forgive me, Fenton, is it Patterson? Correct. Thank you. Fenton Patterson. Also Jay Stone. Uh, we're expecting Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, William Walls, and Frederick K. White. Please join me in giving all of them a warm welcome and thank you all for being here. During the next 90 minutes, these candidates will answer questions from our esteemed panelists, and they include Maria de los Angeles Torres, who's a UIC professor and director of Latin American and Latino Studies, Saad Jamil, who's president of UIC's undergraduate student government, also with us is Andy Shaw, who's the executive director of the nonprofit, nonpartisan Better Government Association. Many of you may know him for his work as a longtime political reporter as well for ABC7 Chicago. And Dick Simpson, who is a professor and head of the political science department here at UIC and a former Chicago alderman. Please join me in welcoming all of them. So our format is rather simple. We'll have an opportunity for opening statements, and then thereafter, the panelists will pose a question, and each of the candidates will have one minute to share their thoughts and responses to that question. We'll move through the order alphabetically, and then I'll switch and go in reverse alphabetical order to try and give everyone uh, a reasonable chance to take first and last crack at the various questions therein. And as I mentioned before, we ask those of you to respect the candidates by holding your applause until the conclusion of our forum. So without further ado, we begin with opening statements from each of the candidates, and we'll begin in alphabetical order and start with Congressman Danny Davis. Congressman? Thank you very much. Um, let me first of all thank uh, the University of Illinois and WBEZ for hosting this forum. The city of Chicago is in a serious search for new leadership. Many of the aldermen, as well as the mayor, will be new. Its finances are in dire predicament. Money is hard to find and services com needs continue to grow. Therefore, the biggest challenge will be balancing the budget for 2012. And there is no easy path or easy way to that. Our public schools are failing many of our students. Violence is running amok in many of our neighborhoods. Our police force is demoralized. Unemployment is extremely high. Home foreclosure is wrecking many of the neighborhoods and communities. Fear and anxiety has many of our citizens paralyzed. I propose to bring the kind of leadership to the city of Chicago that will bring the citizens together from every walk of life, every community, every neighborhood, and have people seriously engaged in finding solutions to the many problems that we face. Congressman, thank you very much. And we should point out that we have a time limit for each of the rounds of questions of one minute, if I didn't mention that before. And the opening statements, you'll have two minutes to respond. Um, and without further ado, we move to Reverend Wilfredo de Jesus. I, too, want to thank the panelists and UIC for this opportunity. Um, the number I want to leave with everyone here today is the number 39. Number 39 is, is the number that came into the House of Congress, the 112th Congress, 39 individuals who had no prior experience of political. The country sent a message that they're frustrated with politicians who promise, who have empty promises. And I believe that the reason why I'm running is because I'm also frustrated 
with the politics here in the city of Chicago. I'm running because of a woman named Judith Natkin, who's 82 years old, lived in her house for 60 years in the water department because of $412 harassed this senior citizen. Things like that just frustrate me. I'm frustrated because of the CPS students that are dying in our streets. Uh, we've got Miriam Acosta here, would you stand for a moment, who experienced triple homicide. Uh, I'm running because of people like this. We gotta stop the violence in the city of Chicago. Um, the other reason why I'm running is because I think for, t for too long, we've been operating with a flashlight mentality in City Hall. I think we've been looking at things, the budget, CPS, the violence with the flashlight mentality. And as a mayor, I want to come in and turn on the light and see what really is happening with all these departments that are failing Chicagoans. And I'm frustrated, and that's why I'm running for the mayor of the city of Chicago. Reverend DeJesus, thank you very much. And we turn now to City Clerk Miguel de Valle. I want to thank WBZ, the University of Illinois here at Chicago, the BGA, uh, and the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, and student government and all the students here today. It's great to be here uh, with this distinguished panel. I'm especially glad that we're here at the University of Illinois, our state's flagship public institution of higher learning. You know, my parents moved to the city when I was just four years old. They found union jobs at Zenith Factory on the west side, allowing me and my two brothers to grow up and go to school in Chicago. My introduction to politics was the campaign that got Harold Washington elected as the first African-American mayor of Chicago. I was there when he created a multiracial coalition that brought this city its first ever neighborhood-based agenda. I'm running for mayor of Chicago because I love this city and every single one of its neighborhoods. Each of our 77 neighborhoods has unique aspects. Everyone has different challenges. But as a city, we must face them all together. Good schools, safe neighborhoods, and affordable homes are all things that are on everybody's mind today. But as much as people might be concerned about today's economy and today's challenges, I'm running for mayor because I'm hopeful. We live in a wonderful city. It's one of the greatest cities in the world. I am hopeful because I believe in the people of Chicago. I'm hopeful because together we can find solutions. When we stand together, I know we can get on the right course, the right course that will make neighborhood schools more competitive and will make higher education more affordable the right course that will put enough police officers on the street and ensure all neighborhoods are safe and secure, the right course that will dedicate public funding to create new jobs where they are needed and revitalize our communities, the right course of reform. As mayor, I will provide transparency, I will cut bureaucracy, and I will call for the needed city audits that are long overdue. In the end, I'm a builder. I believe in building coalitions and bringing people to the table, not shutting them out. Under Time. my administration, our city government will take its cue from the people's wants, needs, and hopes, not from those interested in the old politics. Thank you. Thank you. We're out of time. Clerk Del Valle, we now move to Ryan Graves for his opening statement. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to this forum. My name is Ryan Graves. I am a 27-year-old lifelong resident of the Mount Greenwood Morgan Park Beverly community. I am a stationary engineer with Local 399, working in water management for the City of Chicago. I have to go to work tonight. What are the qualifications to be mayor of the City of Chicago? 18 years old, registered voter, city resident, in no debt to the city, and no felony convictions. I meet all of these qualifications. I believe there are five major issues that are interrelated. Number one is jobs. Let's start with the three R's, relief for the unemployed and poor recovery of the economy to normal levels, and reform of the financial system. Number two is housing. Pressure banking industry publicly for loan modifications. Lower the interest rate to 2% for two years and extend the length of the loan. Gradual increase of that rate. Number three is crime. Expedite gambling at McCormick Place East to immediately hire 1,000 police officers and install more cameras across the city. This should also bring jobs, revenue, and increase tourism. Number four, education. Approximately 51% of your property tax bill goes to the Board of Education. Any state income tax increase that Governor Quinn or anyone passes must result in the hiring of more teachers, smaller classroom sizes, and property tax relief. 
Number five, the city budget. It's currently smoke and mirrors. Career politicians worry about re-election instead of real solutions. There's a structural deficit we need to correct. Chicago is ready for a fresh start. Thank you, Ryan Graves for mayor. Thank you, Ryan Graves, and we move to John Hu. I thought it might be better to stand up here. It looks a little better. <laughs> Close students, faculty and staff, distinguished panel, Chicagoans. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to show you what I will do as mayor of Chicago. I'm not Republican. I'm not Democrat. I am your true independent candidate for mayor of Chicago. I don't want to make decisions on party affiliations, to make partisanship decisions or inside political deals. For far too long, the people of Chicago have lost their voice in city government. We haven't had any choices for the last 21 years. People ask me every day, John, why are you running for mayor of Chicago? I tell them, Chicago needs change, real change. Not the verbiage that you hear from career politicians or political insiders every day. As mayor, when I make a decision, the question that I'm going to ask myself, first and foremost, is, does this hurt the citizens of Chicago, or does it help the citizens of Chicago? That will be the first question I ask myself before every important decision I make for you. The one reason that I got into this race that really was the catalyst was the Chicago parking meter lease deal. A lot of people talk about it today, but it's something that I really stress. Politicians never pay, me, pay to park their cars, nor do they even drive their own cars. I think they've lost touch with the city of Chicago and the people of Chicago. My administration will show more accountability, better transparency. They will be more efficient and less wasteful. My name is John Hugh, and I'm running for mayor of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Hugh. And in the interest of alphabetical order, I'll ask you to hold for just a second, Mr. Stone, and we get Fenton Patterson here to give his opening statement. Sir? Hello. Yeah, it should be on. Hello. My name is Fenton Patterson, and I'm running for the office of mayor of the city of Chicago simply for accountability. I think for too long that the city of Chicago, which is a great city, and the current mayor have been doing a great job. But at the same time, there's questions of some of the dealings that was being made and are being made today. As far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure a lot of the other residents and taxpayers of the city of Chicago and businesses are concerned. So I decided to run for this great office of mayor to make sure that the taxpayers and the business industry in the city of Chicago are exactly getting a great return on whatever dollar they invest in this great city of Chicago in all aspects, schools, businesses, the, the gamut in which this great city is built on to ensure that this city continue to be great, but more important I have a problem with the direction in which this city is going in. We have institutions, and these institutions, I think, can look further into the stars. In order to be a great city, you have to grow. You can't limit yourself to, I would say, just business as usual. And there's technology out there. I think Chicago should start looking into to create jobs, to excite the students the children, criminals, all of these we can tie into technology and looking towards the future. That's why I'm running. Mr. Patterson, thanks so much. And now we turn to Jay Stone. Thank you. In 2009, the Illinois Reform Commission held open hearings. Anybody could attend and offer their testimony. As far as I know, is the only candidate for mayor that testified in 2009. Now, two of the reforms that I proposed to the Illinois Reform Commission passed the Illinois General Assembly and were signed into law. Those two reforms are, have to do with campaign financing and ethics reform. One of them has to do with campaign contributions. 
for the first time ever, the city of Chicago has campaign contribution limits for candidates running for mayor, city clerk, city treasurer, and alderman. Those campaign contributions uh, limits take effect January 1st. I knew the city council and the aldermen were not going to impose any kind of restrictions or limitations upon themselves. The second uh, campaign fi financing reform that I proposed and that passed was uh, um, campaign contributions go by a, uh, um, a political cycle rather than a yearly comp contribution. So if somebody donates, uh, uh, if it, it was a yearly cycle, a yearly campaign contribution be at $5,000 it would be $20,000, but if it was a, uh, on, based on a political cycle, it would be $5,000 for the entire four years. But let me tell you why I ran for, uh, ran for political office for the first time in 2003. In 2000, I found a knife on an airplane. Uh, I found out it was legal to carry weapons on planes. I gave the knife to Rod Bogoyevich with a letter that said, airplane passengers are given a false sense of security because uh, they, they, they don't know weapons are allowed beyond the metal detectors. So I asked Rob Bogoyevich to lobby the FAA and his colleague in Cong Congress to stop allowing weapons on planes. And I, and I wasn't seeking publicity then. I wasn't seeking public office. I just wanted to Time. make airplanes safer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. And we move on now to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Ms. Van Pelt Watkins. First of all, I want to extend my thanks to UIC and to all the people that are here today that's given us an opportunity to share what we believe needs to happen in Chicago. I'm running for mayor because I believe that it's time like never before for us to have a fundamental change in the way we approach city government. I think the way the city government has interacted with the people shows that they don't value the ideals and visions of the people, but rather there's a few people in back rooms making deals that govern all our lives. I think it's time for a change. Because I love this city. I've lived in this city all my life. I'm a product of uh, CPS schools. I was raised in Cabrini Green Projects. Um, I've, uh, I'm a PhD now. I have a PhD in management. I'm a certified public accountant, and I've committed my life to, to improving the lives of families in this city. I'm a, I've built coalitions. I lead, uh, I've developed ordinances that have become law. Uh, I led uh, a $3 million community-based organization that has successfully worked with communities to build relationships across ethnic lines and religious lines and across uh, uh, geographic lines. And I've done all of that without being a politician. I've done that because I believe that we need real change in this city and that it's people's voice that's going to make that change. I don't think that we can think that we can lean on our laurels and, you know, this is a great city and we can lean on our laurels and that it's going to be okay and we can leave our future in the hands of the politicians. I think that's a bad mistake. I, I'm, I'm convinced that in order to have the kind of change that we must have in this season, then it's going to take the people's voice coming back to be a part of the government. So I'm laying out an open participatory government, not one that I'm talking about, not one that I'm telling you that I'm going to do because you can trust me, but because I've done it. I, I lead a co coalition that works in Springfield that fights for human rights for all people. I've developed housing for low-income families, and I've, uh, I've ran drug dealers off the street, so I'm not afraid. And, I, and I, like I said, I have a Ph.D. in management, so I've gone forward in education, and I'm ready to take the reins, and I'm ready to bring the people's voice back into government. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. And we now turn to William Walls. Mr. Walls. Yeah. Good afternoon, and first of all, thanks to the host, and thanks to all of you, thanks to the listening audience and the viewing audience. I'm William Doc Walls. I was born and raised in Chicago, graduated Horace Mann Elementary, Chicago Vocational High School, Tuskegee University, and Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago Kent College of Law. I served as a top assistant to Mayor Harold Washington. I'm competent, knowledgeable, experienced, and I'm fully conversant with the functions, operations, and inner workings of Chicago city government. I ran against Mayor Daley in the last election, and the issues then were more contractual than they were personal. The issues now that matter to people are at the fore of this campaign. One of the most important things is our lack of industry. We haven't had an industry to call our own since the stockyards and not since the steel mills left Gary, Indiana. So I want to be the nanotechnology mayor for the city of Chicago. Nanotechnology is the process by which you make products that are cleaner, lighter, stronger, and more precise. It is the next big industry. It's going to be ten times bigger than Silicon Valley. It's going to be bigger than the Industrial Revolution bigger than the invention of the steam engine and the invention of the wheel. 
So I want to fight to make Chicago the world center for nanotechnology development and nanofabrication so that we are forever economically viable. I want to help people unthink their economics and develop a smart economy that guarantees every Chicago resident a better quality of life. And a smart economy includes the proliferation of cleaner, greener, more energy efficient and technologically advanced manufacturing plants. A series of public-private partnerships funded by our, our $8.5 billion capital improvement program to help Chicago businesses grow, effectively compete in the national and global marketplace, increase production, and create 100,000 self-perpetuating private sector jobs. We have to spend more money on education, rehabilitation, and skill development, and a whole lot less money on incarceration. And finally, we have to have comprehensive tax reform to stimulate our city's economy and foster full employment. Mr. Wallace, thank you very much. You. And we finish with our opening statements from Frederick White. Mr. White. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank UIC and WBEZ and all the audience members. Uh, I'm running for mayor of Chicago. I started in April 2010 after the primary. I got tired of listening to the politicians that we elect to represent us, call each other names, come up with no ideas whatsoever to get the economy going, pocket funds and become rich and their families rich, and say the economy is going great, everybody's got a job. This is just not true. I put up a website, uh, frederick-k-white.com, to show everybody how easy it would be to run for mayor or one, run for alderman. You hear the politicians talk, it's costing $5 million to run for mayor or millions of dollars to run for alderman. That's a false. It does a, all it takes is a good, strong heart and something you want to do to help people out. On my website, I asked for young college grads to join, to run for alderman and run for mayor. Because of my website, I have 158 people that told me that they are running for alderman this election, which is great for Chicago. I look to see Chicago. One thing that we have, I, I'm a lifelong resident. I work for the city of Chicago right now. I've been in every neighborhood. We need jobs. There's about a 40% unemployment in the city of Chicago, and the jobs are just leaving. We also have a problem with our small businesses and our business community in Chicago where people are shopping outside of the city and this is depleting our tax base. We don't get taxes because our money is being spent in the suburbs and other states like Indiana and Wisconsin. We got to change that. I have ways on my website to change that at frederick-k-white.com. Uh, it's a whole lot of uh, ways. There's five or six different easy fixes on there. Uh, I want to be mayor. I want to work for you. I know what I can do. I know that this is, uh, you know, politics. I am not a politician. I am independent. I am not Republican or Democrat. I can work with everybody that gives me their ear. Uh, thank you for letting me be here again, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Mr. White. We're going to now turn to questions from our panelists. Now, with this round, you have one minute to respond. We have our timekeeper in the, in the front here, so if you get the yellow 15-second warning, you'll know that it's time to wrap, and the red double zero means that you're at time and need to finish. Um, for those of you who can step forward to the front of the stage, I would ask that you do so. Uh, nice tradition here established by Mr. Graves because that will make everybody a little bit more visible to the audience and also to the various camera angles here. So if that's possible for you to do it, it may not be possible. You're tethered, but you could come up here. You know, I'll trade spots with you if you can come up here. All right. So without further ado, let's begin with our first round of questions, and we will actually do the questioning in alphabetical order as well. In this case, we'll start in reverse alphabetical order and begin with Professor Simpson. Professor? And uh, several of you made some comments about the economy. In Foreign uh, Policy magazine, Chicago is now ranked as eighth among the global cities of the world. Yet in many, pl like many other places, we're suffering in the recession. I have a three-part question to answer which parts you can within your minute. First, what is your view of how economic development and economic recovery should occur in Chicago? Second, what do you see as the best way not only to improve our position in the global economy, but to make sure that the wealth from the global economy is shared more broadly so that the gap between rich and poor in Chicago is lessened rather than widening as it is now? And most specifically, what would you do if you were mayor that would be an economic initiative that you would pursue? All right, we're going to begin in reverse alphabetical order. So the first response goes to Frederick K. White. Mr. White? I want to thank you for your question. Uh, we have a loss of jobs in this city, about 40%. Uh, one of my uh, 
uh, projects I would do, I would do a Chicago water bottling plant. This would create roughly three to 600 jobs in Chicago. Uh, the bottles designs would have Chicago skyline on them, promoting the city, Chicago's finest. This could be sold in our restaurants, our hotels. Uh, it'd be a positive image for Chicago. It promote tourism to get other funds coming to Chicago. I also have a, a trade dollar that I would like to produce in Chicago to be spent by the citizens of Chicago, our local economy. The citizens would be buying those trade dollars at 80% on the dollar. The businesses would accept them at face value to get people shopping locally. In return, they can sell those trade dollars to tourists. And another positive uh, image of Chicago would have like the skyline colorized or Wrigley Field. I'm a numismatist. I deal in rare coins and precious metals and the history of money throughout the history of uh, the world. Uh, I've seen these uh, work in other countries and other cities and other states. Maui, Hawaii is one that uses a trade Thank dollar. Thank you, Mr. White. Your time's okay. up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And we turn now to Mr. Walls, William Walls. You know, in this uniquely well-ordered, well-structured society, things don't just happen by chance. Things happen when people with a plan act purposefully. We have an $8.5 billion spending program here in the city of Chicago, a capital improvement program, and typically we use that money for road building. That creates temporary jobs and we engage in unnecessary beautification acts. Well, at this point in time, we have to launch businesses into the national and global economy, a very complex national and global economy which was made possible by the painstaking development of a global civil society, not-for-profit organizations, educational institutions, churches, and others, non-governmental organizations. We have to become competitive. We have 2,000 businesses in Chicago that are ready to go. We just need to give them the money for jobs creation. I will identify those businesses, give them two, a million dollars each, so each of them can employ 50 new people and get out in the national and global economy and bring money, jobs, and opportunity back to Chicago. Thank you, Mr. Walls. And now we'll hear the response to the same question from Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think in order to make Chicago attractive and keep it attractive, it's important that we deal with something beyond the facade of Chicago, beyond the, the downtown uh, buildings, and start looking at the 77 neighborhoods that are, that are there to sustain Chicago, and they fund the people in, the, in those communities fund Chicago. So I think what we need is the open government. We need to be able to track where we're spending money. We need to invest our, our precious dollars that we do have in, in more communities and provide more opportunities for people because in all reality, uh, the small businesses are provide 80% of the jobs we have in this city. So I'm looking not just outside to bring in, but how about strengthening from within and out? And if, I think if you were to talk to the uh, residents in the, in the neighborhood and the business owners in these neighborhoods, they would say to you, reach from within and help build us up so we can provide more for other people. Thank you very much. Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, thanks very much. And now we turn to Jay Stone. Thank you. Uh, I have an MBA from Loyola University. For the economic initiative, people of Chicago are taxed, fined, and feed to death. And when, you, when people have less money, then there's less money moving through the economy. It's called the multiplier effect. Every time you spend a dollar, somebody will take two or three cents, and then they'll spend the 97 cents and so on. So we need to hold down the taxes, fines, and fees, not only for individuals, but also for corporations. To improve, uh, uh, anyway, plan, my plan to get more business to Chicago is you have creative people with ideas, people that have ideas, but they don't have the funding. So what I would do is create a group uh, bringing the people together with the ideas for new businesses, new products, new services with the financial investors. Um, I guess I'm out of time. So. Thank you, okay. Mr. Stone. You have 15 seconds if you like. Okay. Um, we'll bring it back to you later. Fenton Patterson. Well, I believe in an extra account. And that account is simple. The government say we have money to invest in neighborhoods, we have money to invest in businesses. And again, I say, let's offer some of this money to all of the communities, all of the business. You have a product, you can create jobs. This product work, we're willing to invest into you. In addition, prove it works, we pay you off. It don't work, no loss to us, no loss to you. That's my plan for the city of Chicago. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. And we turn now to John Hugh. For the economic initiative for Chicago, right now, Chicago is not a business-friendly city. I have two, two ideas to make Chicago a world-renowned city and get us back into uh, the 
the best uh, economic place in the world. One, the former Michael Reese uh, property that was bought by the city of Chicago to open a technology park with private capital from venture capitalists, from our TIF dollars, we will make one of the best technology parks in the Midwest to make Chicago the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. Number two, I would bring two Asian manufacturers to the south and the west side of Chicago. With technology, with manufacturing, these are the two ways that we will get back on the map for world ec economic success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. And we turn now to Ryan Graves for his answer to the same question about economic policy. Hi, how are you guys? There's a lot of different ways to bring economic, you know, bring development back to the city of Chicago. Number one, if you look back at the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he had the WPA, Works Progress Administration. It's in essence a stimulus package. That's what we need here. That helps with infrastructure and everything else. That will get the immediate families and people out of work working right away. We're losing manufacturing every day and we're not going to be able to stop that from all going overseas. People, if they don't have a manufacturing job, they're going to turn other ways to make money, gangs, etc. Number two, TIF money. TIF money is supposed to be used for economic development in blighted areas. It's supposed to be for schools, parks, and infrastructure. That gets people working if it's used correctly. Um, outside contractors. I know for my own job, there's people from Indiana, Iowa, Wisconsin, etc. getting the work in the city. Now, that's not fair if there's people in this city who can do that job correctly. The company should be here. That money should be staying here. And the people in the hard working people to pay the taxes here in the city should be able to have those jobs. They can do it too. And lastly, I think a casino, if you hire a majority of city Time. workers, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graves. <laughs> Miguel Del Valle. Most of the jobs of the future are going to come from existing businesses, existing manufacturers in the city of Chicago. So the question is, what do we do to make sure that we eliminate the mismatch that there is today between what the manufacturers need in terms of a skilled workforce and what is available. And we have many manufacturers in the city of Chicago that have said, we cannot find the trained workers. Austin Polytech, for example, has trained machinists. And the manufacturers are partners in the training process. Therefore, the training is tailored to meet those needs. We have to do that. We have to look at advanced manufacturing. We have to find niche markets in order to be, be able to compete in terms of trade in this world. And I think Chicago is in a good position also to help its small businesses grow. Most small businesses in Chicago will tell you that they're choking Time. to death. Thank you, Miguel Del Valle. And now we hear the same response, to, or the responses to the same question, rather, from Wilfredo de Jesus. So I sat on the board of the ZBA for five years. I've seen small businesses be put through hell. To open up a barbershop, you've got to at least open it up with fifteen dollars to $20,000. The city of Chicago, as a mayor, I want to make sure that we are friendly, small business friendly, and not make them jump through hoops just to open up a barbershop. Number two, I think we have to welcome the big box. No one wants to, wants to talk about that. I want to welcome that. I want to welcome the union to be at the table. But Chicagoans need jobs. We need to capitalize on green. We need to retrofit some of our buildings to be able to capitalize on what's happening in energy. No one's talking about that. And that's something that I want to do as a mayor of the city of Chicago with the small businesses to be able to retrofit our buildings that uh, we own as a city. And also we want to be able to encourage these big boxes to come into the city of Chicago. At the end of the day, people need jobs. Well, Fred de Jesus, thank you very much. And the final response in this round goes to Congressman Davis. Thank you very much. I would retrofit every city-owned building in the city of Chicago, and we would experience a tremendous amount of energy efficiency savings. And then I'd use that money to try and attract very aggressively light manufacturing so that people can actually produce things. We cannot continue to live on a service high-tech economy. It just simply will not work. Light manufacturing, retrofitting the buildings, energy efficiency would be a great way to go, and that's exactly where I'd start. Thank you, Congressman. Congressman Davis, and we continue on with our questions now. We move to Andy Shaw of the Better Government Association. Andy? 
Steve, let me say first that it's a privilege for the BGA to be partnering with UIC and BEZ. That's a stellar group of initials, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. It's also wonderful to see a room full of people in this mayor's race. It means that we're engaged. It's exciting to see 10 candidates on the stage. The only bad news is it's very disappointing that a number of candidates aren't here. And let me say from a good government... <laughs> Let me just say from a good government standpoint, from the standpoint of civics and democracy, that as this campaign continues, let's hope that none of these candidates are running Rose Garden campaigns and they all understand the importance of taking their cases to the people like you're doing today. Right. Okay. Right. My question is the, the reverse of Dick's. He wants to know what you do to build the economy. Let me start with the bad news. Uh, a deficit that the next mayor will face that could approach one billion dollars. Let me ask you very simply, as you take over the mayor's office in April of, of 2011, where do you start downsizing, where do you start cutting, where do you start economizing, because you're going to have to do a lot of trimming and reorganizing to get out of this mess. That question goes first to Congressman Davis as we begin marching in the other direction alphabetically. Congressman? Well, thank you very much, and I certainly agree. In order to deal with the budget crisis that we face, there's one of two things that you're going to have to do. One is you're going to have to create efficiencies, and you've got to find places to create them. For example, there might be a better way to pick up garbage. Rather than using the ward-by-ward -ward basis, you might want to use a grid system. You may want to cut out some of the mid-management that continues to exist. You might even want to consolidate some governmental activities with other units of government, such as holding elections jointly with the county. And rather than having the county run an election, the city run an election, just run one. Or you may have one health care delivery system that you connect with community-based health centers, with Cook County government, and other private instances Time. of providing health care. So those are Thank some you, ways. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, same question goes to Wilfredo Jesus. So they tell us it's around $650 million, the deficit, thereabouts. I think they're not really telling us the truth. That's why I want to turn on the light. I think we're way beyond the $650 million. But what would we have to do when I become mayor of the city of Chicago? is the mayor's salary has to be cut. The superintendent of police makes more than the mayor. That has to be cut. It just doesn't make common sense. We, as an administration, would have to look for the fact and begin to cut across the board in order so that the people of the city of Chicago doesn't have to carry this, this burden that lays be, uh, before us. So as a mayor, I want to be able to do a forensic audit, bring some people. I've had the budget for a month and a half, and I still don't understand it. I want to make sure that the budget is, is able to be read even by a fifth grader that we have in the city of Chicago. And we're going to be able to go into this mayor's office and find where are we wasting money to be able to save on one end. Thank you. Thank you, Wilfredo de Jesus. We now turn to Miguel Del Valle. One minute to solve the budget deficit. <laughs> now 45 seconds. Cuts. That's right. At least for $100 in cuts, maybe $150 million. New revenues. Any individual who says you can get out of this by just cutting is not leveling with you. We need new revenues. That's why I've proposed a financial transaction tax. Let's go after the guys selling the bonds in the market who are making the big money. They're back. They're making big money. We have to balance things. And we've got to make sure that they help us out of this mess because they help get us into this mess. And so furlough days, sacrifices across the board have to be made. Grid system. All the ideas that are up here have to be part of the process. It has to be a comprehensive approach, and we all know that. The question is, how do you get it done? The city council has to assume responsibility for this budget. We need a strong mayor and a strong council in the city to Time. get that job done. Miguel de Valle, thank you very much. We now turn to Ryan Graves. Hi, how are you? The deficits. Well, there's a lot of different things you can do. Number one, you definitely have to downsize and cut down people. That's tough to say, but I know in the Department of Aviation alone, one city entity 
There's 48 people that make 93,000 or more in upper management. The TIF money needs to be spent the right way. You have 15 million going to the Board of Trade, 10 million to Republic Windows, and we're luring companies like Boeing, Willis, United, and big business here with favors of money. Crony contracts need to be eliminated. I don't have anybody giving me money. I spent close to 10,000 of my own money to start this campaign, and I don't owe anything to anyone. Donors give money for a reason. Joe Moore recommended, and this was in the Huffington Post, he recommends that there has to be a forensic audit to double the Inspector General's budget and establish an independent city budget office modeled after New York. He thinks that there will be 91.3. Mayor Daley said there will be 91.3 in favorable revenues next year. That's pretty hard to believe. There's going to have to be a mid-term contract resolution, and they're already saying that $32 million from labor is going to be given. They haven't even come to the table to talk to us yet. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Thank you. We now hear from John Hugh about his solutions to the budget problems facing the city. With a $6.15 billion budget next year, I beg you, do not give Chicago any more money. We don't need it. There's so much, so much waste and inefficiency in government. If you've read what I've wrote on my website, I tell people that within the first two weeks of office, I will hire an auditor outside of the Chicago area and with no connections to Chicago, LA, New York, Denver, a company to come in to do a complete forensic audit of every department of the city of Chicago. Do you think that out of $6.15 billion we can save 10%? How about just even 1%? There's so much waste in the city of Chicago right now that when we find those dollars with the first 40 million, I'm gonna hire 1,000 police officers. With the next 20 million, we're gonna make sure that the jobs programs and other, th other things in Chicago will go forward. There is a lot of waste. We need to take care of that. With that forensic audit, we will make sure that every dollar is accounted for, every Thank you, Mr. Hugh. is accounted for. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to Fenton Patterson. Mr. Patterson, your response to how to address the budget situation well, facing the city. One thing I don't want to do as mayor is to create more unemployment. But what I do want to do is hold all the departments accountable because that's where I feel a lot of the waste is. And again, there's business we invest in that I feel truly that they have a slot machine mentality. We do have professional work. We come back, we get paid, we do it again, we get paid. And I figure we can save money that way by fixing those companies that comes into Chicago and give us less than quality work. Mr. Patterson, thank you. Jay Stone, your response to the same question. Yes. Um, what we need to do, we need to hire professionals, not politicians. Uh, for example, uh, Al Sanchez was hard in, in charge of streets and sanitation. He was convicted in federal court as part of the hire, hired truck scandal, the job rigging scandal. Donald Tomsack was a politician who was in the water department, he's the deputy water department commissioner. We need to bring in professionals. Every department in the city of Chicago has to be run by professionals who understand the budget, the need for services. Uh, another thing I would do is called zero-based budgeting. Uh, budgets are usually set, uh, you know, projected revenues, we're down 2%, we'll cut everything by 2% or we're up 2% and we'll increase everything by, no. You start everything from scratch and you bring in professionals that have ideas and that will put them in place as the day one they take, start their jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Stone. We now turn to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Thank you. As mayor, I think the, all of us would say up here, all of us just going, running for mayor, that we have to reduce uh, our costs and we have to find new revenues. We need that forensic audit so we can check and find out where corruption is. But I think what's most important is that we begin to open government up and become transparent because a lot of this corruption and all this stealing is done because things are done behind closed doors. We got to open it up. I will provide a way for citizens in this city to track every dollar down to the neighborhood that they go to. And that's going to get us to a place where we won't be uh, so in the red so much um, because we won't be stealing as much. And I think that that's what is going to get us where we need to go. And in order to, to, um, to bring more uh, revenue into the city, I think we need to look at the public safety budget. We spend 60% of our budget on public safety, yet the leading cause of death in this city is murder for people under 35. It's got to change. Thank you. Thank you. And we now turn to William Walls. You know, the reason I'm running for mayor is because I'm sick and tired of the government overtaxing poor people 
to finance the lifestyles of the rich and politically connected. We've asked city employees to take furlough days, 24 furlough days. That amounts to a backhanded pay cut. But we have yet to say to the big government contractors who earn millions and billions of dollars a year to reduce their profit margin. We will demand that they reduce their profit margin from 30 percent down to 10 percent. That alone will save $600 million next year. In addition, we cannot continue to tax food and medicine and things that poor people need. We cannot continue to look the other way as the fat cats run to the bank and other people go to the poorhouse. So we will certainly make certain that we have a 10-hour a day, 40-hour work week for city employees, four days a week. That will save money for the city, and that will give people another whole day to spend with their family or taking care of their own personal business. We have to become a humane government. Thank you. Thank you. And the last candidate to address the question in this round is Frederick White. Mr. White. Yes, as I stated on my website, the first thing I would do as mayor would take a 30% pay cut. Not only that, I would give the alderman a 30% pay cut and a 30% budget cut and all the top executives 20%. We cannot ask the citizens of the city of Chicago to keep on raising your taxes and give themselves bonuses and their salary increases. And they're due a salary increase on the 1st of January. It's automatically voted in. Uh, every January, they voted their self a salary. I think you, as the citizens of Chicago, should vote on our salary because you're the one that's paying us to do the work. Uh, second, we do have to create more revenue in the city of Chicago instead of just keep on raising taxes. That's not the way to go. Uh, like I said, the Chicago bottled watering plant. Water bottle is a billion dollar year industry. We have it all over the place. Why aren't we producing it? Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we using this money to pay for our city services? We have a lot of great city workers here. I would promote from within. They've already been here for years, and they know exactly what's wrong with the departments and know how to cut the budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And we knew, move on to our next question, and it comes from Saad Jamil. Saad? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My question is in regards to higher education. With the recent decreases in uh, state funding from, to the University of Illinois, how do you, as mayor, plan to keep University of Illinois a financially accessible, um, financially, ac sorry, financially accessible place of higher education? The question is about the University of Illinois, and it goes in reverse alphabetical order this time to Frederick White. I truly believe in higher education. I will look to talk to the corporations in the area, see if we can get grants to help educate uh, for uh, high school students who are going on good grades and good tracks. I know that the, there's funding cuts through federal grants and federal programs, and it's a really hard and difficult time right now because of the budget crisis throughout the whole entire country and throughout the whole entire economy. But you go to the businesses and see if you can get their help. You know, they're making millions of dollars or billions of dollars on the people's backs, and maybe they can help finance or help fund college students in certain programs to help their own businesses. We would work with the businesses to try to have a program where we can get students in, working for the company at the same time, maybe, and have them pay for their education. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And William Walls, you know, same question state, to you. In the state of Illinois, there are seven forms of revenue, income tax, sales tax, federal aid, gambling, motor fuel taxes, public utility taxes, and fines, fees, and assessments. Well, they cut the map grant funding because they said there wasn't enough money to go around. They suggested that we could use gambling as the means of paying for higher education. That makes no sense whatsoever. Education is too important to trust it to gambling, something that has a negative impact on society. We have to commit to that. One of the things that we can do to help offset the cost of higher education is naming rights. You see, recently, the city of Chicago's transit authority has adopted my idea. I suggested naming rights as an eighth form of revenue for the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. We could name not only buildings, but we could also name auditoriums and give people to be, an opportunity to be involved and have part ownership in their institutions without actually owning it, just having your name on it. That would generate additional income to help offset the cost of education. Thank you, Mr. Walls. And the same question now goes to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Yes. So first of all, 
as I said earlier, I think that we need a fundamental shift in the way that the city interacts with the residents. I think we need to change the way the city operates. And I, and I think we should change from having this father uh, kind of image, this, the city being the father and, and the residents being the children. I think we need to pull together as a family. We need to figure out together how to move forward as a family. In other words, communities are a part of the solution. They're not just a recipient of uh, opportunities, but they also bring opportunities. And as one of my colleagues said today, getting corporations to begin to kick in is important. And different people, people have scholarship money all over the city they put together for different students and different programs. So I, I would encourage that. But more importantly, I think one of the reasons we have such high costs in these universities is because we're poorly preparing our high school students to come into college. And I think that if we take the time and deal with that problem, then we will reduce the cost of college education because they won't have to spend so much time with the remedial classes. Thank you. Time now for Jay Stone to answer the same question about affordability and accessibility of higher education and the University of Illinois specifically. Mr. Stone. Thank you. I, I appreciate your question. I, I think it's important that we prepare students even before they get to college. And what I mean by preparing, it's not just reading and writing and arithmetic, but making them good citizens, responsible citizens, citizens so that they'll help to defray some of their costs. So we need good economic viability for the city. Uh, as for myself, I worked when I went through college and my sister who went to graduated from college, she worked her way, uh, worked all through the, while she attended University of Illinois Circle Campus. I've also guest lectured here, so I met many students, and they too are working. We need to keep the city economically viable. Um, I, I don't know if there's any, you know, we can't just hand students money and say, here you go. But it, it is harder today to go to school uh, than when I, when I went to school, and I, my hat's off for anybody who's trying to better themselves through education. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Now it's uh, Mr. Patterson's turn, Fenton Patterson. I think any government or any business, any organization that owes an institution finance should pay the bill. In addition, I think a smart move for students is if you don't need to take so much of the loan money, give it back. Do not come out of an institution with a degree but has a, a loan value which you feel your degree is not worth it anymore. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. And the same question now goes to John Hugh about the affordability and accessibility of higher education. You know, when I attended your sister school, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, I think my yearly tuition was probably about $3,000. So I know that today the importance of an affordable higher education for especially the technology industry to the city of Chicago and to businesses is required. What I meant, uh, we, about a couple weeks ago, I spoke at North Park uh, University and I mentioned to them that I wanted to install a program where any person who graduates from, Illinois, from an Illinois school and works for the city of Chicago in a public service area, meaning teachers, meaning social workers, where there's a great service that is rendered to the city of Chicago, that we would start a loan forgiveness program so that you can afford to basically live, to do your job and be able to pay back your loans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Same question to Ryan Graves. Hello, how are you? Um, well, this is more it's difficult to tackle this object because it's federal money. You need to work with federal people as well. But the map cut is definitely one of the major things because the funding is just not out there for you know citizens here. And I know that there's this new thing, the Dream Act, that I haven't been able to look over thoroughly. But it's going to give illegal aliens money to go to college as well, which I'm not against because everybody deserves the right to an education. But if that is going to affect citizens that are here legally. You know, you have to take a hard look at that. But the number one thing is to pressure private loans because the interest rate is just, you know, it's exceedingly huge right now. So, I mean, you need to publicly battle them because I know people around my neighborhood, when they graduate, if you don't find a job within those first six months, you're, 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 you're out of water, you know. You're not going to be able to make the payments on the loan, and it just keeps doubling and doubling and doubling. So you just have to pressure them publicly. And you need to work together with, you know, be it President Obama and Senators Durbin and Kirk to get more federal money for here for our citizens in this city. Time. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Miguel Del Valle, your thoughts. I propose three initiatives. One is to, in Chicago, dramatically 
increase the number of students enrolled in dual credit programs in our high schools and dual enrollment programs. Also, to bring to the University of Illinois a program that is in pilot form right now downstate that the Illinois Student Assistance Commission has started called the program, where you are given a MAP award, you start in a community college, but the tuition that you pay and the difference between that tuition and what you pay at a four-year college where you're duly enrolled, enrolled is banked. And so you have additional resources, financial assistance, to pay for your last two years of college. The third is the three plus one. That's really innovative. Be able to do three years in a community college so you lower the cost of college and then one year at a university and you get your degree. Mr. Del Valle, thank you very much. Now to Wilfredo de Jesus. Well, I, I support higher education and I know it's kind of difficult for students. My daughter comes here to UIC as a junior and I realize uh, the struggle that students are facing. They're looking at a bill that they're probably not able to pay because there's no jobs. And as a mayor, what I want to do is create a pipeline of internship with corporations, businesses that would be able to uh, take on these students that are coming out of college, at least give them a sense of hope that they're able to pay for their bills. Because uh, I think that's the main thing that students are looking for. As they're looking towards the future and they're getting their bachelor's degree or master's degree, they don't see the job that can complement what they just spent on their tuition. So as a mayor, I want to make sure that that pipeline is there for them to be able to secure some type of resource, to be able to have some type of pocket money uh, as they further their education. Thank you. Reverend Jesus, thanks very much. And the final response this round goes to Congressman Davis. Thank you very much. I am a strong supporter of higher education. Traditionally, municipal governments have not been funding higher education in this country. I think that one of the things that we can do is make greater use of what I call work-study colleges and universities, and there are only a few of them in the country, which I strongly support and have legislation pending to assist them now. At this time last year, one of our top students, Rigo Padilla, was facing deportation. He was given a, a temporary stay until this year. Um, it's up again. Uh, um, in this, actually this week. Uh, many, uh, like many of the 65,000 students who graduate from U.S. high schools without documents, Tigo was brought to the United States as a young child. While everyone admits that our immigration system is broken, neither Congress or the White House have acted to reform it. Indeed, the opposite has happened in the last few years. More people have been deported under this administration than any other time in the history of the United States. Municipal governments have had to step in. Our own city government supports the plea to stop the deportation of students by uh, a bipartisan request, I may add, and indeed has a standing order for the police not to work as immigration uh, agents. Uh, this is good policing practice, but more is needed. If you become mayor, what would you do to help protect undocumented residents of the city of Chicago? And that question first goes to Congressman Davis. I am a firm believer in what I call comprehensive immigration reform. I believe in protecting individuals' rights who are in this country. I would continue to uphold that provision where City of Chicago police would not be acting as immigration agents. But I also continue to be an advocate so that we ultimately get past the kind of reforms that are needed to protect families not split them up and let people know that America is still big enough and broad enough for people from all over the world to come and experience its goodness and its greatness. Thank you, Congressman. Wilfredo de Jesus. We believe that God created the institution of family. And as the United States, we have done nothing to keep our families together. Over 300,000 undocumented brothers and sisters are being deported from this country. Some who are American citizens. They're just only 10 years old. In 2009, I traveled to Postville, Iowa to witness over 360 individuals that had the ankle bracelet. The United States prison, their husbands, 
And the wives and the children had no means for food. So in, in, in regards to the undocumented, the city of Chicago, as a mayor, I want to make sure it's a safe haven that every undocumented that's here in our city, regardless of your ethnicity, I want them to know that as a mayor of the city of Chicago, I'm going to protect them here as a mayor. Thank you. Reverend Jesus, thanks very much. And Miguel Del Valle. I'm proud of the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago has had a policy in place for some time that says that local law enforcement individuals will not engage in enforcing immigration policy. That is the job of the federal government, not the job of local officials. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that one of the candidates who is not here today is responsible to a great extent for not allowing immigration reform to move forward in Congress when he was a congressman, and then as chief of staff of the president, not allowing immigration reform to move forward. That's the fact of the matter. We should have had immigration reform, and that's what we need in this country. If we had immigration reform, then we wouldn't be having to fight over the DREAM Act or over other provisions. It is time for this country to reform its immigration system. This is a country of immigrants, and it is the right thing to do at this time. It should have been done a long time ago. Miguel Del Valle, thank you very much. Ryan Graves has a chance now to respond to the same question. Mr. Graves? Hi, how are you? Um, I think if the, uh, you know, if the mayor, whoever's in mayor, be it myself, as long as they're legal or illegal, as long as they're not breaking the law, they shouldn't have anything to worry about. The police aren't going out of their way in the city of Chicago to break down doors and threaten them, you know what I mean? Um, if they're resident or non-resident, their safety is in everyone's best interest, you know, be it the police or whoever, you know, the mayor. Um, but uh, I know that, you know, Mexico right now, they just found 18 people in, in 11 graves. So, I mean, they need to get their own house in order, I think. And I think that, you know, once that they prove that they can help out getting the house in order, I think immigration reform will move forward on a federal level. But uh, here in the city, it's tough for one man or us here. We can make our mark as best as we can. Ryan Graves, thank you. John Hugh, your response to the question on immigration policy. The great city of Chicago has always been known as a sanctuary city. I will follow that tradition as mayor of Chicago and make sure that none of the police officers use any type of questioning for immigration or other issues when they pull over illegal aliens or any other people who are not here legally. I will continue that in the city of Chicago as a sanctuary, sanctuary city. I believe that we do need uh, immigration reform, and currently things are being done to get those passed. And certain issues of the DREAM Act I do approve of. Uh, but what I don't approve of the DREAM Act is if those same people take away the loans and the grants that uh, American citizens have the right to, I think there should be an alternative for them to get funding through private sources. They should not be able to take the loans that you are currently uh, entitled to. Thank you. Mr. Hugh, thank you very much. The question this round concerns immigration policy, and it goes now to Fenton Patterson. Mr. Patterson. If this Immigration Act entails equal rights for every nationality, if one Hispanic comes to America on it, one African, one Asian, I'm all for it. <laughs> but again, accountability. If the city's in deficit, then I question. How much is it going to cost the city of Chicago? Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Same question to Mr. Stone, Jay Stone. Yes. I grew up in a home with three generations. My grand grandparents were from Europe. My parents were born here, and I was born here. Immigrants, whether undocumented immigrants, they're human beings. They're entitled to rights. Um, my mother worked um, in a nonprofit organization for 15 years supporting immigrants. I would support uh, the nonprofit organizations that are working directly with immigrants. I'd also uh, try to help up, try to set up some legal aid for undocumented immigrants where they can get uh, legal advice to help, help them stay if they're entitled to. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Stone. We now turn to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins for her response to the same question. For years, I've worked in the African American communities, and at first, I didn't see the connection between the immigration issues and the black issues. But at, over time, I understood that it was all about families. It was about keeping families together, uniting families, for valuing the service and, and, the, and the offerings of the people that are here in this city. And my research showed me that the net, we have a net benefit as a result of having uh, immigrants in this, in this country. And so I, I sent a group of people down to Arizona to help people or, uh, organize people and to um, get people to sign up to vote. Because I think what's important is that the people that are here that care about this issue, we have to build ourselves out. We have to find ways to make connections across ethnic lines, religious lines, across community lines, and work together. And that's what I believe for the city, that we need a fundamental shift in the way we operate and the way the city interacts with the people. We need communities organized, communities speaking up for themselves and empowering themselves to, to address the challenges of our time. Thank you. Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, thank you. And now to William Walls. I said earlier, we live in a global economy that was made possible by the painstaking development of a global civil society, which learned to communicate across all geographical, sociological, philosophical, ideological, political, or linguistic, or cultural barriers. We live in a world society. I support the Constitution of the United States of America, but at the same time, I want to help unify this city by promoting cultural and diversity sensitivity amongst people of all ages, races, socioeconomic backgrounds, all religious persuasions, all sexual orientations, all physical and mental disabilities and limitations because none of us is any better than the rest of us. So whatever it takes to make us whole and recognize that we're part of the human race, I'm for that here in the city of Chicago. Support the Constitution, comprehensive immigration reform, but at the same time just recognizing that we're all just one people and we have to stop allowing people to divide us and come together once and for all. Last response this round goes to Frederick White. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. First, I heard a few uh, people mention illegal aliens. I don't think these people are coming from outer space. Uh, the illegal immigrants that are here, you know, I support immigration, but the illegal immigrants are here. I do not support them being given a has to be here legally. There's a lot of immigrants that are trying to get to this country. They're on waiting lists. I think there should be immigration reform in this country, but I don't think just because someone's here illegally, they should be given a free pass that's wrong. That's not basically, we're a country of laws, and that's not based on what America is. We have to go by the laws first. They're breaking the laws. Go back, come legally, you're welcome with open arms. But you can't just come here illegally and say, well, now that I'm here, I want a free pass. That's not what it's about. And I do not support a sanctuary city, and I would not support illegal immigration in that, that way. I would support legal immigration and immigration reform to try to help everybody get here legally and in the right way. So it affects everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And we now move to our next question, and it goes back to Dick Simpson. Professor. Each of you um, might be the best possible candidate for mayor. You might have the best platform, but that alone, as all of us know, doesn't necessarily make you mayor or let you win the election. Specifically, how will you raise the money? How will you get the precinct workers? And how will you attract the campaign staff that will let you win the election? That question goes first to Frederick White this round. Mr. White. <coughs> Yes, I work for the city of Chicago right now. I am a Teamster, local 700 member. I am pro-union. I'm very pro-union. My family's been union. I've talked to a lot of our uh, workers already uh, to help get my word out. I set up my sites. I understand that we do need to raise other revenues besides just raising taxes. We can't tax the seniors out of the houses. You know, the wrong way, we have to have a uh, tax freeze on all residential units of four units and less. We have to look at other ways to raise revenue. Like I said, the Chicago water bottling plant would be a billion dollar year industry. There's other ways we can have grow farms in the city of Chicago. We can put a plastic recycling plant in the city of Chicago. We have to create jobs. We have to create jobs all around for everyone. We just can't keep on going the same way over and over again by raising taxes because when you do that, you send business out of the city of Chicago, you send the citizens out of the city of Chicago to shop for a better bargain, and we lose our tax base and we just keep on losing Losing it more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, we turn now to 
Mr. Walls uh, the question about how will you mount the campaign to be successfully victorious in your effort. As I indicated, I ran for mayor of the city of Chicago in the last election. I've actually been involved in two other elections. I was involved as a candidate for U.S. Congress and had a dry political run for governor of this, the state of Illinois. Politics ain't beanbag. It's hardball. And you don't just get elected mayor of the city of Chicago because you have vision. And I do happen to have vision. But I also understand that there are five stages to a campaign. Management, message, money, media, and manpower in that order. And you have to go at it not just strategically and scientifically, but with concern and with a real understanding of the realities of Chicago politics. Chicago has for a long time been ruled by kings, queens, and political leaders with a birthright. And the average ordinary people have had no place to go. I'm a grassroots candidate. And as a grassroots candidate, it takes a little more time for me to gain traction. And I hope and I believe that people have gravitated towards our message. It only cost us 50, 35 cents per vote in the last election. Thank you, and Mr. Walls. And we now turn to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> um, I've so far I've raised 400, uh, nearly $400,000, and I turned in 41,000 signatures. Uh, so I am safe. I'm on the ballot. Um, I think it's important for opportunities, uh, for us to have opportunities like this opportunity to allow the candidates to hear, have their voices heard above the clutter and ab above the white noise. I have here, I have all my campaign staff, the campaign manager, strategist, media specialist, field director. I have all of them, and they're in this room right now, as a matter of fact. And I want you to know that the reason why I've been able to do what I've done is that people have supported me and given me money. So with that in mind, I want to let everybody know, if you want to support me, go to www.patriciaforchicago.com because it's going to take you and you and you and you and all of us to get us elected. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Van Pelt Watkins. Jay Stone, same question to you. Well, I want to tell you how you don't run for office. I have the federal court testimony from the Robert Zorge trial. Uh, the, the attorney, U.S. attorney doing the direct examination is Patrick Collins. He says, did you ever receive any instruction from Mr. Reyes or Mr. Dorr for any congressional races? Yeah, Rahm Emanuel. And what office do you recall Mr. Emanuel was running for? Congress. So, and what makes this worse is that the six, in, in the year and a half uh, before the city of Chicago paid for Rahm Emanuel's campaign workers, Rahm Emanuel made $16.5 million. Rahm Emanuel didn't pay for his campaign workers when he ran for Congress. You paid for his campaign workers. And so think about that, because he, he's the big elephant in the room that's nobody talking about. So you go home and you tell your friends that you paid for Rahm Emanuel's campaign workers, and you're going to remember that when you go to vote. Thank you. Jay Stone, thank you. Fenton Patterson. Your response to the question about political viability and how you mount a campaign to win? Well, I guess I'll mount it the same way I mounted to get here. Hard work. Go out there, talk to the people, talk to the companies and businesses, and ask them for their support. State my ideas and let them determine whether or not I'm the candidate they want to support. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. John Hughes, same question to you. I think I might be a little naive. I didn't know that you needed that much money to run for mayor of Chicago, because I haven't raised any yet. But when I saw the last election on November 2nd, I was sick of all the ads that were on TV. I basically shut it off, because all they spent their money on was bringing down the other candidate. In this, in this century, with social media and the internet, I plan to use every dollar that I have, and from people like you, who believe in what I have to say and what I want to do for the city of Chicago with the $20, $25 donation, I'm going to use that money effectively and get my word out to every citizen in the city of Chicago. I will not put down other candidates. I will only make sure that my name gets out there using those resources. Thank you. We now turn to Ryan Graves. Mr. Graves. Hi, how are you? Um, I had the unfortunate uh, task of Sheriff Tom Dart, a neighbor of mine, dropped out of the election about October 27th. So I didn't start my campaign until November 4th, and I was able to gather 17,000 plus signatures with the help of family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. They've been telling me they don't want more of the same. 
I spent nearly 10,000 of my own money, as opposed to Gary Chico, who one of his top donors, developer Bob Wislow, and CEO of U.S. Equities, Lou Weisbach, CEO of Stadium Capital Financial Group, Art Velasquez, President of Azteca Foods, de developer Dan McCaffrey, President of McCaffrey Interests, Rahm Emanuel, his donors, Beverly Hills Event, Reception, hosted by President of Disney, his brother, etc., United Continental Airlines CEO, Abbott Laboratories Chairman, Northern Trust CEO, and other corporate executives. We don't want that as the city of Chicago. They have favors. They're not giving money because they like the guy. I know that I've gotten sun <laughs> You know, I, I know I'll be able to raise the money. When people believe you can do right, you'll be able to get the money will come in. You know, I've spent money on Sun Times ads, websites. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Same question to Miguel Del Valle. Well, four years ago, when I became city clerk, I pledged that I would not accept any money from people doing business with the city. I've continued that. At the beginning of this campaign, I challenge all the other candidates to make the same pledge. Not a dollar from anyone contacting or making contact and, 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 and contracts with the city. You know, we have to change the definition of viability in, in campaigns. You know, particularly progressives who want to see progressive candidates advance, but then question whether or not they can advance without the big money. And where does the big money come from? It comes from Wall Street. It comes from Los Angeles. I don't have friends in Beverly Hills. I'm sorry. I don't have friends on Wall Street. But I do have a lot of friends out in the neighborhoods, the people I've worked with for many, many years, who are going to go door to door as volunteers, unpaid individuals who will be getting out that vote. Democracy will be ignited in the city of Chicago in this historic election because of that type of campaigning, not because of 30-second spots Time. on TV. Thank you, Mr. Del Valle. And we now turn to Wilfredo De Jesus. $140 million is what Whitman spent in California. Money does not win you an election. A message does. I think I'm the only one of the Hispanics that are running that's being challenged. So obviously our message is resonating with the people. We've got a mobilization of over 500 volunteers. I did not pay for one penny of the signatures. I know other candidates who have paid for a dollar, five dollars. This is why I'm running, to get away from this political monster. So money gets you so far, but if we have a message, which we believe we do, that's resonating with the people of the city of Chicago, I think at the end of the day of February 22nd, people are going to come and say, I want to vote for the Jesus for mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now close this round with Danny Davis. Congressman? I agree with Professor Simpson. It does take a lot of money to run elections. I've been fortunate. I've won three elections for the Chicago City Council. I've won two for the Cook County Board. I've won seven for the United States House of Representatives. And I've never had a whole lot of money. But I've been able to raise some. I do have a campaign structure in place. I have a campaign manager deputy campaign manager, two or three coordinators. I've got a campaign chairman. I have a finance committee chairman. And so we're off and running. I won't raise as much money as some people. But I tell you what, I will raise the hopes and aspirations of the people. That's who've elected me every time I've ever run for office. And that's why I think that I'll get elected. Thank you, Congressman Davis. We've now come to our final round of answers and the final question, and it goes to uh, Danny K. Davis first. We'll move down, but it comes from Andy Shaw. Andy? As was mentioned earlier, one of the city's biggest recent fiascos was the rollout in the early administration of the parking privatization contract. It has been universally scorned and rejected and pilloried by virtually everyone. So as you move forward in the city, as we look to places where we might or might not privatize, Midway Airport, uh, streets and sanitation, water, sewers, all of those things, Tell me what you would or wouldn't privatize, and what condition would you place on the consideration of privatizing anything? Congressman Davis. Thank you very much, Andy. I'm not a big fan of privatization. I believe in it when you know that it's going to work. But I understand that when you shift money from one group of people, then you give it to somebody else. I'd much rather see workers, people working every day, earning a decent wage, being able to take care of their families, having health insurance. So I really wouldn't look to privatize that much. 
I would look to assess and evaluate revenue generating ideas and come up with the very best ones that we could find that would keep the people in the city of Chicago safe, working, secure in their homes, able to send their children to school, and I don't think there's a better way to do it. So I'm not a privatization fan, I'm a workers fan. Congressman Davis, thank you. Alfredo de Jesus, Reverend de Jesus. Common sense, right? I want to know why the politicians who are in office today did not raise up the concern when that was done. Why, why are they speaking out today? Why wasn't it spoken? When I came out as a, uh, running for the campaign, I came against it, privatizing, which was a poor decision. Mayor Daly has done some good things in the last 20 years, but this one has to go down in history as the poorest decision to privatize. Again, I'm not a politician, but why couldn't we do that, what they're doing, and give the jobs to the people of Chicagoans and keep that money, the revenue that comes in, why couldn't we just do that? So I'm not a proponent of privatizing. What I am is looking at every avenue, all of our aspects, and make sure that the future of our children is protected here in the city of Chicago. So I don't believe in privatizing all of our assets and making sure that they stay right here and bring the revenue to the city of Chicago. Thank you. Miguel Del Valle. I participated in the discussions in the Illinois General Assembly around the Midway Airport proposal. And labor came on board with that proposal. And one of the reasons they came on board was because in the legislation, it clearly states that part of those proceeds would be used or will be used to the pension funds, which are in big, big trouble, uh, not just here in the city of Chicago, but throughout the state of Illinois. And so under those circumstances, I would seriously consider and look at a midway compensation proposal. But it would be very different from what happened with the meter deal, where there's where there was no deliberation on the part of the city council. And I think that's the biggest problem that exists whenever any type of proposal comes forth. That's why we need a strong council. We need a council that actually deliberates and opens up to the public and allows proponents and opponents to chime in so there's truly a legislative process that takes place that ends Time. up in the best decision possible. Thank you, Mr. Devaye. And we now turn to Ryan Graves. Hello again. Uh, privatization. First off, private companies are in it for a profit. This is a fact. Municipal employees, like myself, are only in for a job and a paycheck, and we take pride in what we do in the city. Um, a lot of these privatization turns into crony contracts. 93% um, of the 75-year lease will be spent in three years for the parking meters. Parking garages cost you $31 to park for a half hour. Who gets the money? Not us. Um, you need shorter leases if you're going to privatize with a cut of the profits, be it 10% a year or whatever it may be. We need more long-term money in, in terms of no more bad front-end money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Graves. John Hugh. It would be a travesty to give away another great Chicago asset. So when it comes to this question again, I ask yourselves, I ask myself, does it help or hurt the citizens of Chicago. I'm a realist. I've been reading about how the Midway Airport deal will probably you know, be privatized, things like that. If it needs to happen, what will we do with the money? Will, part of, will a third of the money go toward our school funding? Will a third of the money go toward our pension deficit? What will happen to those funds? Will it be wasted, like the Chicago parking meter funds, where we almost got $1.2 billion and now next year we'll have about 76 or 78 million dollars. I would ask myself those questions before any more Chicago assets are given away. And when I say given away, Chicago is on the wrong end of every deal. We lose money on everything. We need to get someone in there, like myself, to make sure that every deal works for the city of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. And now the same question to Mr. Patterson, Fenton Patterson. I am a, a hmm. I have a problem with comprehending a deficit. When you have a deficit, at least you have a resource to pay for the deficit. But when you privatize everything that the city of Chicago owns, what do you have to pay for in the future? I'm against privatizing 
any of the city assets because in the long run, in the future, I think we're needed. And not only that, I think they belong to the taxpayer of the city of Chicago. And as mayor, I work for one thing, one person, and one concept only, making sure that the people of Chicago get a return on their tax dollars. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. And Jay Stone. How many people are aware that the same company that got the parking meter lease also got the parking garage lease? Not one person, one, two people. That, the parking garage lease was $562 million. That's half of what we got for the parking meter lease. It went to the same company, Morgan Stanley. And we absolutely blew, blew the parking garage lease. Uh, we didn't put any restrictions as what the parking garage company can charge. It's Morgan Stanley, by the way. And that's why you're paying $31 to park at Navy Pier, et cetera. And that same company is buying up all the small parking lots in downtown Chicago, so they're creating a monopoly. But let me just tell you something about Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley had to pay billions of dollars to settle all sorts of legal actions. Morgan Stanley was a distressed company that was going out of business. They couldn't even give the business away. And we, we, the city of Chicago bailed out Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Stanley is going to have some financial troubles down the road. I promise you that. Thank you, Mr. Stone. And the same question about privatization now goes to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Again, <laughs> I believe we need to fundamentally change the way the government interacts with the people. And I think our value system, we have to bring the government back to our own value system, the things we value most. And the p privatization of our assets is just old politicians digging an old bag of tricks, bringing out old tricks and pretending like they're new, to, to continue to rape our city and rape our, our the future. And I think that it's important for us as the people of this city to begin to demand that the city begin to reflect the visions, the ideals, and the hopes of the people that live here. I think that we need to look at new ways of addressing our challenges. I'm not looking at privatization. I'm looking at new ways to address our challenges. And I think we need to demand that across the board, and that's what I'm in support of, reaching and learning new ways, reaching out to people, learning new ways to address the challenges that we face and, and making sure they reflect our visions and ideals. Thank you. Ms. Van Pelt Watkins, thank you. And now we turn to William Walls. Like you, I don't like privatization. Privatization is a sinister scheme, a plot that daily used to reward his friends, punish his enemies, and avoid the Shackman Decree. Back in 1983, Harold Washington, without prodding, signed the Shackman Decree, and that alleviated the need for city employees to go out and do political work for well-based politicians. Now, Mayor Daley has turned to privatization as a means of allowing his contractor friends to get the contracts so that they can then force their employees to go out and work politically in the system. I mean, it's the same old thing washed over. So we have to get away from that. Privatization is horrible, even when it comes to charter schools. I don't like charter schools. I support a superior public school education for each and every individual child. So privatization has an ugly ring to it. We've got to be more supportive of city workers and workers in general and take that onus and burden off of their backs. Thank you, Mr. Walls. And finally, Frederick White. Mr. White. I'm against privatization. With privatization, you lose three things. One is revenue from the future. You lose that. Two, you lose control. Uh, a lot of you have heard about the city employees were standing around with rakes and shovels. Uh, it was in the news. What they didn't report, they were waiting for a private contractor to deliver the asphalt to the job site. You lose control of all your material delivery. Three, you lose jobs. A lot of the private contractors, their jobs, the people who work for them are out from outside the city of Chicago, suburbs. Indiana, you heard Wisconsin, and other states. You lose that revenue, too, as our tax base. I'm glad one of the um, candidates brought up the pension problem that the city of Chicago has. I would privatize Midway Airport, looking at that, not privatize it, but give it to the unions to supplement the pensions with the write-off, a 25-year contract, and then with the understanding that new employees would be put on a uh, 403k program to have their own pensions, a Roth IRA. And how many candidates right now are running, are drawing a government pension? Ask that. Mr. White, thank you very much. And our thanks to all of the candidates for taking the time to be here in this uh, forum today to share their thoughts. Please give them a warm round of applause. This has been a thought-provoking exchange. I know for many of you, 
probably the first chance you've had to hear in depth from these candidates. We greatly appreciate all of you making the time to do so. And again, to echo Andy's missive at the early outset here, we hope that we will have the chance to hear from all of the candidates in this race as it continues. My thanks as well to our panelists, Nana Torres, Sajamil, Andy Shaw, and Dick Simpson. Please give them a round of applause for their excellent questions. Thanks also to the Office of the Chancellor, the Office of the Vice Chancellor of External Affairs here at UIC, the UIC Student Government Association, the Better Government Association, the Institute for Government and Public Affairs here at the University of Illinois. And thanks finally to all of you for taking the time to be here, to listen, to engage. Election Day is February 22nd. The campaign is on. I'm Steve Edwards, and thanks again for being here.